Uh, hello everyone, I'm Cameron, and I'm here to talk about Bricks from Deserts, How Microbes Can Save the World, which, nice life. So, housing. There are lots of people who lack houses. Um, in 2005, an estimated 100 million people didn't even have houses, which has actually gone up as uh, natural disasters and uh, wars and displacement due to refugee crisis. Now, to actually make a house takes a lot of energy. You, to make the average American wooden house takes 22 80 foot tall pine trees. That's a lot of um, a lot of plantation wood, and you know when you harvest plantation wood, you risk land slip and other things. And uh, to build brick houses for all of the currently homeless rural people, people living in rural China, you would have to harvest 25 percent of all of the arable topsoil in the country. So we need an alternative to this that doesn't involve eating up topsoil, killing trees, or cooking bricks at a thousand degrees for seven days. That's what you actually have to do to make a red clay brick. You have to heat it in a kiln at a thousand degrees for seven days, and that's a lot of energy. So my solution to this problem comes in the form of MICCP, which stands for Microbiologically Induced calcium carbonate precipitation. It's a process that um, microbes can do that can cause solid calcium carbonate to actually come out of solution. Um, there are a couple of pathways to do this, ones that digest urea, ones that digest sulfur, ones that work simply by photosynthesis. It's really pre prevalent. prevalent? Um, <laughs> for example, chalk. Most of the chalk in the world is actually formed through this process being the uh, carbonate, the calcium carbonate shells of coccolithopores, a ancient tiny microbe. <clears throat> so the one pathway we decided to investigate was the urease pathway. In this, you add urea to a urea, a sample of urease positive bacteria. This causes the pH to rise, which causes more um, carbon dioxide to be dissolved into solution. So effectively. It cleans carbon dioxide from the air. This increased carbonate uh, concentration causes the carbonate to be more susceptible to precipitating out when you add a electrochemically favorable thing such as calcium. So if you add calcium to something that has a really high carbonate concentration in an alkaline media, it will, cause, it will just cause crystals to form of calcium carbonate. Um, and essentially what happens when you do this is a crystal when it forms needs a nucleation site. That's a tiny point that the crystal can grow around and um, get bigger. And these nucleation sites, a really good way to, to make them is to add sand to your sample. This causes the crystals to grow on the surface of the sand and then more crystals grow on the surface of the crystals and you bri build bridges between the sand grains, sticking them together. The best part is this isn't actually a theoretical process. This is something that's being done right now. Um, back in 2005, uh, Professor De Jong uh, demonstrated that you can increase the resistance to crush of sand um, significantly. Uh, at the moment, uh, Professor Dozier is currently building bricks using this method, which is what we aimed to do as well. And the architect, Magnus Larsen, actually proposes building a 3,000 kilometer long habitable wall across the southern end of the Sahara Desert in order to stop the Saharan sands from blowing more south and increasing the desertification of Africa. So this is what we produced. I actually have it right here. It's a solid takeaway food container full of sand and calcium carbonate crystals. To make it, what we did was concentrate on the idea of making a cheap pre-mixable system that you just add sand and bacteria to and it creates a brick over time. At the moment, um, Professor Sophia's method requires drip feeding and large facilities, but if this is actually going to be a system that can be you know, economical and ecological, it needs to be something that can be simply mixed up in your shed, um, ideally. So we took sand, added 
urea, calcium lactate, and a ton of nutrients, including brain heart infusion and yeast extract, which are really favorable to the bacteria we chose. The bacteria we chose was Enterobacter hormaceae. I hate saying that word. Um, it was selected by going to a stable and taking a soil sample from a stable because horses urinate a lot. And where there's urine, there's urea. They sort of go hand in hand. So soil in stables does tend to have quite a high concentration of urease positive bacteria. Then we took all of this, mixed it all together, and stuck it in a 25 degree incubator for two weeks. And it produced this, the actually really quite solid brick. So in order to confirm that it was actually calcium carbonate, we decided to take some uh, electron micrograph micrographs. This here is headache inducing because the projector is a little bit blurry, so I apologize for that. But what you've got here are sand grains. This is just sand with um, sodium lactate on it. Uh, these graphs are electron backscatter analysis, which can tell you the elemental composition of what you're looking at in your um, electron micrograph. So over here, uh, this particular thing is pointing to titanium dioxide, which is what makes up the majority of Australian sands. And there's also sodium lactate just covering the whole thing. This was a sample that had no bacteria in it. So there's no calcium carbonate in the entire thing. It's just sand and salt. This, on the other hand, is, wow, even worse to look at. Um, in the middle, we have a grain of sand. Everything around it is calcium carbonate. This was something that was, um, this was actually from this. On the microscopic scale, this looks like that. There is the, the calcium carbonate attaches to the sand grain and grows a whole matrix around the sand, sticking it together. And uh, um, if you look, this is the same thing with what's known as an electron backscatter image, where you look past the surface. <coughs> all up here, this huge white area, is all calcium carbonate. And these tiny little dots everywhere are spaces where microbes once grew. Around those microbes form the whole, form a crystal that links down and links all the microbes together until it reaches the sand, which sticks to the calcium carbonate, binding it all together as the microbes die off slowly, preventing possible contamination. Um, as to the actual strength, the bricks aren't as strong as clay bricks at the moment. Uh, however, we're only currently growing iteration two of the method and the nutrient levels. We, this one here is not as strong as a clay red brick. And my current hypothesis is that it's not as strong due to a lack of calcium. It just didn't have enough calcium and nutrients to grow fully all the way through. So theoretically, by increasing the nutrient load even higher, you can increase the calcium carbonate and thus the strength of the brick. We don't have a fully accurate measurement of the strength itself, but that is um, fourth time, rather. So, what do we plan to do in the future? Well, at the moment, something that's very interesting is the use of spore-forming bacteria versus non-spore-forming. All the current literature talks about spore-forming bacteria, specifically, well, generally, um, Sporosarcina pasteurae. It's a bacteria that uh, is urease positive and can store a lot of its genetic material in spores that can be resuscitated after periods of um, great stress, which theoretically means that if you were to break a brick with spore-forming bacteria, you could stick it back together, add some urea, water, and nutrients, and the, brick would, and the brick would glue back together. It does, however, have the added complication of meaning that it's more possible to contaminate the environment with bacteria. <coughs> non spore forming bacteria are less likely to actually 
regrow in your brick, which is you know a blessing and a curse because it means that you can't investigate breaking the brick and reforming it. But it also reduces the risk that you're going to contaminate your environment with um, <coughs> bacteria, especially in our case, considering we're using an enterobacter, which is not the nicest of bacteria to use. Um, another thing to investigate is molds, using molds to make anything you want. Um, what really kicked this whole project off was a video of an artist using a similar method to produce a stool out of sandstone. Just pour it in the mold, leave it to set, and break it out and sit on it. That's actually an entirely possible thing to do with this method because you just make up a slurry of the sand and mold it. The possibilities for upscale or downscale or you know, applications are really quite diverse. Um, we also have the great idea of using this to actually reduce carbon in the atmosphere because it's it uses carbon in the reaction. So potentially by doing this, not only are you not spending energy on making bricks, you're reducing the carbon load in the atmosphere by making the bricks in the first place. Um, and, well, yes. Uh, I'd like to move to my thanks and thank uh, my supervisors, Tom and John. I'd also like to thank Michelle for unending help and the prep room staff for letting me loot the prep room every now and then. And also Dr. Carsten um, down at the CSL for helping with my microscopy. And thank you very much. Thank you, Cameron. Yes. Um, in a real world scenario, do you have a concept of where the urea and nutrients from the microbiology would come from? Like, say, in the southern Sahara? Uh, ideally, well, urea and the micronutrients themselves are really quite common. These bacteria can grow on practically anything, and urea is a relatively common byproduct of the actual production of um, nitrogenous products for making fertilizers, which is globally, like it takes up 2% of the world's power supply in terms of actually being used. The urea itself is very, very cheap. And you don't need to use like microbiology grade urea for it either. Uh, at the back. Oh. Um, if I open my you know, first second year chemistry a little bit, temperature has a large effect on crystal size growth. Mm. Are there any plans at this stage to look at the effects of growing your bricks at different temperatures for their rheological? Yes, actually. Um, one of the aims of this project is to create something that can be done in, in almost no conditions, which means that we do have to investigate what the best conditions for crystal formation are, including temperature. Ideally, it's something that, as I said, you can do in your home or on a farm if you were building something. But yes, we do need to investigate the um, temperature crystal growth relationship. That would make sense if you're using a microbiological organism that probably going to die at warmer temperatures than that anyway. Mm. Yes, yes, definitely. Thank you. Um, has anyone studied the formation of mud bricks? Because obviously they are no, just using the sun and they have straw and organic matter and calcium in them. Mm. Uh, but they're clay based as opposed to sand based. Mm. which is what you were speaking of, because that might get around in another way, the issue you raise about the, the energy costs of clay bricks, but you know, in the West we could be perhaps making our bricks using kind of a combination of what you're suggesting and, and existing technology. Mm, yes, that is actually a um, good idea. The one issue with using mud is that uh, lots of mud that is used for that sort of thing is actually sourced from um, otherwise arable top topsoil or mud pits, which are not the um, most ecologically friendly thing considering the amount of uh, mining and stuff that you have to do to do it on a large scale. But yes, um, combining mud technologies with the calcium carbonate precipitation could actually increase the strength of mud bricks and yeah. run the whole system a lot faster. Yeah, just because your system, unless you've got calcareous sands, 
You know, most of those genes of silica, they don't have calcium in them. Mm. Well, you don't need um, calcareous sands, actually, because you can just add it as a supplement. Uh, what we used was calcium lactate, because the lactate itself can be digested by the bacteria. Um, and calcium lactate is just a health food supplement. It's actually quite common and cheap to you're get. Make, you're making calcium carbonate, so can, half of that is calcium. Mm. Yeah. yeah. One more question. Uh, I've heard you were had your hand up a couple of times. Um, so you you spoke about the, the bacteria potentially getting out into the um, environment mm -hmm. and questions that, that poses. Like, A, what, what can it actually happen again if it did, would it just start cementing your garden? Or, um, <laughs> and is there a way to, to just to, to get a, a, a particular strain that, that, that isn't gonna, gonna leave, but it's still spore forming, so you can have the best of both worlds? Uh, well, on top of cementing your garden, that's actually another avenue of research, using this technology to cement sand in um, wet sand areas to make foundations for buildings stronger. But it's not going to cement your garden unless you have a really calcium-rich garden. Right. Um, as to actually preventing the bacteria from getting out, uh, the motility of the bacteria is quite low. So ideally, if you're building with this particular thing, because the sandstone is rather porous, you should be sealing it um, when you're using it, which ideally, if you seal it properly, won't actually pose much risk of things getting out, ideally. OK, I think uh, a few other questions <coughs> yeah, out there, but maybe catch uh, camera at uh, lunch break. Thank you very much.